Greetings and welcome to an Odyssey into Oratory. If the Spirit so moves you, please follow if you're listening and subscribe if you're watching. With either, please like and comment as I'm your grateful host, Dan Riley. In two earlier podcasts, I dedicated the entire episode to rhetorical devices. I believe that they are that critical to great speech making. I'll put the links to both of those in the description below. They, being rhetorical devices, are the spices that make an otherwise bland dish delectable or unpalatable, depending on the objective of the rhetorician. Because of current events, I'm going to come at rhetorical devices one more time today, but unlike my previous podcasts, I'm coming at them from two distinctively and diametrically opposed applications. One dark and sinister, and the other hopefully warm and high. One brought on by the news, the horror of our times. The other, a repurposed derivative of the former. Currently in the Western world, the Russian-Ukraine conflict is dominating the news, almost to the exclusion of everything else. The pandemic scoreboards are gone. Masks are being shed as fast as ties on casual Dress Friday, and from the little leaguers to the politicians, all are donning the blue and gold colors of the Ukraine. Notwithstanding that there are 50 other wars taking place right this very second on our planet, some that started as far back as 1947, and yet all the attention is on the Ukraine. As an aside regarding these endless wars, someday history will hold my generation, hold us accountable for letting these wars happen. Paraphrasing Terence McKenna, we have let ourselves be led by the least among us, the least intelligent, the least noble, and the least visionary. I guess that's a topic for another day. Back to rhetorical devices and the media. Most people suffer from the illusion that the content of the media coverage is the most persuasive component. There is an unchallenged assumption that content matters more than the structure of the content. On how the content is presented, that view is mostly wrong. The form of the argument is often the more persuasive part of the narrative. Neuro-linguistic programmers have shown us this for decades. Let's look at the rhetorical structure the media is using to report the Russia-Ukraine conflict. To be clear, I'm not analyzing, I'm, to be clear, I'm analyzing rhetoric, not veracity. They start with the rhetorical device of antithesis, which, which pairs exact opposites of contrasting ideas in a parallel structure. Virtually every headline is structured so that a person will pick a side, and it's obvious the side for which the authors are advocating. World narrowly averts a Russian-caused nuclear catastrophe. The global consequences, Russia is going too far. Ukraine seeks ceasefire amid Russian shelling of civilians. These headlines purposely evoke such powerful visual images, another rhetorical device, by the way, favorable to Ukraine and unfavorable to Russia, that 99% of the readers or listeners, if they haven't already picked a side, will side with Ukraine. Following the headline, the body of the reporting uses one of the oldest of rhetorical devices, Aristotle's pathos, an appeal to the emotion of the readers or listeners, to their decency, to their basic humanity. The media shows countless unspeakable images of inevitable inhumane circumstances inherent with all war. But they only show the victims of the side for which they are advocating. And sprinkled through all the reporting are two subtle but very powerful rhetorical devices. Eponym and sententia. Eponyms invoke the names of famous or infamous persons as a way to assign their attributes to the current target. In the current Ukraine-Russia situation, I'm sure you've heard Hitler and Stalin's names invoked a few times. Sententia is a rhetorical device that uses famous quotes that support a particular point of view. There are no shortages of 
Churchill quotes flying around these days. Now, in the Eastern world, they are using the same rhetorical structures. U.S. has bombed 35 countries since World War II, yet calls Russia rapacious. U.S. ignores Ukraine's eight years of ethnic cleansing. U.S. censored Ukraine's involvement in the Maidan massacre. 50 Russian children were burned alive. And of course, they follow that up with the horror story suffered by their civilian populations. Since the respective rhetorical success of both Hitler and Churchill during World War II, weaponizing words are now part of warfare. In fact, propaganda is a major component of modern warfare. Parenthetically, those two words, by the way, should be an oxymoron, modern and warfare. But it's even worse than that. Through lack of context, deception, and outright omissions, propaganda has been folded into the very large psychological component of modern war. As the late California Senator Hiram Johnson said during World War I, the first casualty of war is truth. And as a lover of words, that makes me sad. That's the shady side. Now for the sunny side. Let's have some fun. One positive outgrowth of war has been the elegant and soaring poetry that it has inspired. And here's a little factoid that a lot of music lovers aren't aware of. Literally hundreds of popular songs, new, old, and in between, were first poems. Lyrics make for great rhetorical devices. They are preloaded with emotion, historical context, and the complexities of life. And their worth is already established in the marketplace. A writer or speaker can spend two paragraphs explaining a complex dilemma. Or they could just quote Robert Frost, two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the road less traveled by. While talking about quotations, many speakers like to use quotes new to their audiences. That's not always the best idea. Audiences love to hear quotes they already know. It makes them feel kindred to the speaker. All right, back to songs and poems. I'm going to give you my five favorite songs that were first poems, and I'd love to hear yours as well. The first one, number five, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosened the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Inspired by the Civil War song, John Brown's Body, Julie Ward Howard was asked to compose new lyrics to the music of that marching song. Most of the lines came to her at dawn, as she tells it, one morning, all tangled up. She furiously hunted around the room to find something to write with, lest she forget the lines. Her poem was published on the front page of the Atlantic Monthly in February of 1862. Number four on Raglan Road. And I said, let grief be a falling leaf on Grafton Street in November. I gave her gifts of the mind. I gave her the secret sign. I concede my Irish heritage probably influenced my pick. Before this was a song made famous by the Dubliners, Van Morrison, and many others, it was a poem written by Irish poet Patrick Kavanaugh. An autobiographical poem at that. Regarding an unrequited love, an old story. He and his desired companion were both living on Raglan Road in Ballsbridge, Dublin. He'd see her coming and going almost every day on the street, mostly going back and forth to college. And as an excuse to meet up with her, he would ask her to critique his poems on a quiet street where old ghosts meet. Number three, O Holy Night. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. My favorite of all the Christmas carols. It was first a poem written by French poet Placido Campo. In a little French town in the 1840s, the local parish had just renovated its church organ. And the parish priest asked Campo to write a Christmas poem to commemorate the occasion. 
fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, night divine. Number two, I'm sure this song would be on many people's list. The Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof to the night that her flag was still there. The lyrics of that poem and ultimately song came from a 35-year-old at the time lawyer and amateur poet, Francis Scott Key. He personally witnessed the Battle of Baltimore when the British Royal Navy during the War of 1812 bombarded Fort Henry. He was so impressed by the U.S. flag with its 15 stars and 15 stripes flying high above the fort after the bombardment and that star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. And my number one, which I don't believe many people will be familiar with. So I'll recite the entire poem. It comes from Jacques Brel. He was a Belgian poet, singer, songwriter, director, and actor. A true Renaissance man. In fact, he had written a few poems that became songs. Other than my favorite, which you'll hear in a second, back in the 70s, the lyrics for the popular song Seasons in the Sun by Terry Jack were actually poet Ron McEwen's adaptation of Brel's poem Les Moribans. Here's my favorite song from a poem. If we only have love, if we only have love, then tomorrow will dawn and the days of our years will rise on that morn. If we only have love to embrace without fears, we will kiss with our eyes, we will sleep without tears. If we only have love with our arms open wide, then the young and the old will stand by our side. If we only have love, love that's falling like rain, then the parched desert earth will grow green once again. If we only have love for the hymn that we shout, for the song that we sing, then we will have a way out. If we only have love, we can reach those in pain. We can heal our own wounds. We can use our own names. If we only have love, we can melt all the guns and give the new world to our daughters and sons. If we only have love, then Jerusalem stands and death has no shadow, there are no foreign lands. If we only had love, we will never bow down, we'll be as tall as the pines, neither heroes or clowns. If we only have love, then we'll be men, and we'll drink from the grail to be born once again. Then we will be nothing at all, but the little that we are, we will have conquered all time, all space, the sun and the stars. Brell's antidote to war. And for my part, that's all there is today. If you are listening, please follow. If you are watching, please subscribe. With either, please like and comment. This is Dan Riley taking you on an odyssey into oratory. Until next time, throw off those bones. Sail away from the sea. Catch the trade winds in your sail. We're on the move.